Save the patient. It's up to you. Rabies virus. This is a picture of a rabies virus. The rabies virus is a member of a family of rhabdoviruses. Infection with the rabies virus causes a serious illness that primarily affects animals, though people can also contract the illness if they are bitten by a rabid animal. Common animal carriers include foxes, skunks, raccoons, bats, and dogs. The disease usually begins two to eight weeks after exposure to the virus. Early symptoms include loss of appetite, intense thirst, nausea, vomiting, and fever. The virus causes its ill effects by damaging the central nervous system. It is generally only a few weeks from the onset of symptoms until the patient lapses into a coma and dies. Untreated rabies is nearly universally fatal. Fortunately, treatment can prevent rabies from developing if it is initiated soon after the patient is bitten by the rabid animal. Antibodies. This picture shows several Y-shaped antibody molecules within a blood vessel. Antibodies are made by the immune system to react with specific foreign invaders, such as rabies viruses. Treatment for people exposed to rabies involves administering preformed anti-rabies antibodies obtained from horses. These antibodies bind to the rabies viruses and help the body to eliminate them before they can do any harm. Next, the patient is immunized with killed rabies viruses. These viruses stimulate the patient's immune system to make its own anti-rabies antibodies. Treatment is essentially 100% successful at preventing the disease when it is given within a few days of exposure to rabies. Of historical interest, it was Louis Pasteur who first explained the cause of rabies. He also developed a method of immunization to prevent the disease from occurring. In the 1800s, this was a monumental achievement. Neuron. The basic function of the nervous system is to transmit messages from one place to another. The nerve cells which do this job are called neurons. Each neuron has a single long branch called an axon, which permits messages to be carried to distant parts of the body. This illustration shows a single neuron with its axon, in yellow, extending off to the left. Normally, neurons perform their functions by conducting electrical signals down the length of their axons. Unfortunately, these same axons serve as the pathway by which rabies viruses migrate from the site of an animal bite to the central nervous system. The further away the animal bite is from the central nervous system, the longer it takes for the disease to develop. The brain. This photograph shows a human brain. It is dominated by the massive cerebrum with its many deep folds. Also seen in the photograph are the cerebellum, located at the back of the brain, and the brain stem. The brain and the spinal cord together form the central nervous system, CNS. The CNS is the control center for the body. The lethal effects of rabies viruses result from infection of the CNS. Without proper function of the CNS, vital functions such as breathing and swallowing stop working. Shutdown of the CNS eventually leads to coma and death. The most reliable method for determining whether an animal is infected with the rabies virus is to examine an actual brain specimen for the presence of rabies viruses. Rotavirus. The illustration at left shows a single rotavirus. Worldwide, it is one of the most common viruses that can infect the digestive system and cause gastroenteritis. The rotavirus is easily spread from person to person in a family or other group setting. Rotaviruses are also found in a number of animal species. 
Rotavirus infection is particularly problematic in infants and young children. And it is responsible for many deaths in undeveloped countries where medical care is inadequate. The rotavirus causes illness by invading the lining of the duodenum and the upper small intestine. The intestinal villi are transiently damaged, but they rapidly regenerate their lining. Illness typically begins with one or two episodes of vomiting followed by diarrhea. Uncomplicated cases resolve in about one week. Treatment requires only rest and adequate fluid intake to prevent dehydration. The small intestine. The illustration at left depicts a segment of the small intestine. The small intestine is a long tube, about 21 feet or 6.5 meters, whose purpose is to absorb food. The inner layer of the small intestine, the mucosa, is very well suited for this job. It is organized into innumerable little finger-like projections called villi. The mucosal cells which line the villi are in turn covered with even smaller finger-like projections called microvilli. The villi and microvilli greatly increase the surface area with which to absorb food. It is the mucosal cells which line the villi that are most damaged by a rotavirus infection. This disrupts the absorption of food and causes vomiting and diarrhea. The middle walls of the small intestine contain circular and longitudinal smooth muscle layers. Under normal circumstances, these muscle layers contract in rhythmic fashion to force the partially digested food along the whole length of the small intestine. This contraction process is called peristalsis. The outermost layer of the small intestine is called the serosa. Microvilli. The photograph at left shows a close-up of a mucosal cell which lines the inside of the small intestine. Each of the tiny finger-like projections on this cell's surface are called microvilli. If we were further away, we could see that the inner lining of the small intestine is itself organized into many small finger-like projections called villi. The villi and microvilli together create a surface area within the small intestine that is as large as a tennis court. The main purpose of this lining is to promote the effective absorption of food. This is a job it is quite well designed to perform. Endoscopy. The photograph at left shows the inside of a normal duodenum as seen through an endoscope. An endoscope is a flexible tube with both a light and a camera lens at its end. Doctors often use the endoscope to examine the digestive tract when a patient develops vomiting or diarrhea that doesn't resolve as expected. Tiny surgical tools can also be manipulated through the endoscope, allowing treatment of a wide variety of digestive system disorders. Coronary artery disease. Atherosclerosis is a disease which results in narrowed arteries and decreased blood flow. The arteries become narrowed because of a buildup of plaques within their inner walls. This illustration shows a yellow plaque within the inner layer of an artery. Plaques consist of a mixture of substances including cholesterol, fat, fibrous tissue, clumps of platelets, and sometimes calcium. Atherosclerosis begins early in life, but generally causes no symptoms until middle or old age. Only after an artery becomes very narrowed will blood flow be diminished enough to cause symptoms. When atherosclerosis affects the coronary arteries, it is called coronary artery disease. Patients with coronary artery disease experience chest pain when the blood supply to the heart is inadequate to meet the demand for oxygen. This pain is called angina. Coronary artery disease is a very common ailment with characteristic symptoms. Angina typically occurs after a predictable amount of exercise, for example walking up one flight of stairs, and is relieved by rest. Medication is available that relieves the pain by briefly dilating the coronary arteries, but this has no effect on the underlying disease. Patients with angina are at high risk for having a heart attack 
if their coronary artery disease is not treated. The heart. Although the heart is constantly pumping blood, it does not actually receive any oxygen from the blood which travels through its chambers. Instead, the heart receives all of its oxygen from the arteries which encircle it. These blood vessels are known as the coronary arteries. This illustration shows the heart and the coronary arteries. Under normal circumstances, the coronary arteries have significant reserve capacity and they can easily meet the oxygen demands of the heart muscle. Problems with supplying the heart muscle with oxygen arise only when the coronary arteries become narrowed due to atherosclerosis. Coronary Angiography It is often desirable to study the coronary arteries of patients with coronary artery disease. Many different tests have been devised to do this. At present, the definitive test for evaluating the coronary arteries is angiography. Coronary angiography is an invasive test that requires placing a catheter in the coronary arteries. Dye is then injected and detailed pictures of the coronary arteries are obtained. This test enables doctors to determine the exact location and severity of the plaques within the coronary arteries. The photograph at left shows a doctor performing a coronary angiogram. Several new forms of treatment for coronary artery disease have emerged in recent years. The most well accepted is coronary angioplasty. Coronary angioplasty involves positioning a small balloon catheter in a coronary artery such that the balloon crosses a plaque. The balloon is then inflated to compress the fatty plaque and make it smaller. When the balloon is deflated, the plaque usually remains compressed. This increases the size of the arterial lumen, central opening, and improves blood flow to the heart. Heart attack. People with coronary artery disease are at high risk for having a heart attack. A heart attack occurs when the blood supply to a part of the heart is suddenly cut off and the affected heart muscle dies. The usual cause of a heart attack is the formation of a blood clot at the site of an atherosclerotic plaque. The clot completely blocks the artery, cutting off blood flow beyond it. The medical term for a heart attack is myocardial infarction. A heart attack causes changes in the normal pattern of the EKG tracing as shown in the illustration at left. Heart attacks are the number one cause of death in Western societies. The risk factors for having a heart attack are well known. These risk factors include a diet high in fat and cholesterol, smoking, obesity, inactivity, high blood pressure, diabetes, and a family history of heart attacks. Fortunately, most of these risk factors are related to lifestyle. It is thus possible for a person to lower their risk of a heart attack if they choose to. Influenza virus. The photograph at left shows a single influenza virus. Influenza viruses are responsible for the respiratory illness popularly named the flu. This illness is spread from person to person through the air by virus-infected water droplets that are sneezed or coughed up. Influenza generally occurs in local outbreaks. Outbreaks tend to occur in the winter months, spreading rapidly through places where many people congregate, such as schools, offices, and nursing homes. The typical case of influenza is characterized by fever, muscle aches, headache, loss of appetite, cough, and a runny nose. The illness typically resolves within a week and does not require any treatment beyond rest and fluids. Rarely, influenza will progress and infect the lungs themselves, causing a severe pneumonia that can be fatal even in young, healthy adults. Most deaths from influenza, however, occur in old people who develop bacterial pneumonia because the viral infection lowers their resistance to other infections. Influenza virus. There are three main types of influenza viruses, named type A, B, and C. The schematic illustration at left shows a single influenza virus. Among the most notable features are the little spikes, shown in white, that stick out from the viral surface. The exact nature of the spikes, glycoproteins, determines the type of the influenza virus. 
immunity to influenza occurs when the immune system makes antibodies that bind to these glycoprotein surface spikes. Unfortunately, the type A and to a lesser extent type B influenza viruses are unstable with new versions appearing every year. When a new version appears, the antibodies still circulating in the body from the last bout of influenza will be less effective at eliminating the virus and the person may get ill once again. Occasionally, an influenza virus will appear that is so radically new that virtually no one is immune to it. When this occurs, the result is a worldwide flu outbreak called a pandemic. The respiratory lining. The photograph at left shows a portion of the lining of the upper respiratory tree. The lining consists of two main types of cells, goblet cells and ciliated cells. The goblet cells secrete a sticky mucus which coats the respiratory lining and traps foreign particles. The ciliated cells, shown in orange, have numerous tiny hairs, cilia, on their surfaces which continuously beat in unison. This action sweeps the sticky mucus with its trapped particles up and out of the lungs. Influenza viruses invade and ultimately destroy large numbers of the cells which line the respiratory tree. This, of course, impairs the function of the lining and causes people with influenza to cough. It also makes people more susceptible to other infections since they are less able to sweep out other potential invaders. Of note, cigarette smoking is also very toxic to the cells of the respiratory lining. This accounts for the chronic coughing and increased susceptibility to upper respiratory infections seen in smokers. The lungs. The lungs are a vital organ which enables the body to obtain oxygen from the air we breathe and to eliminate carbon dioxide. The structure of the lungs can be likened to a branching tree. Starting with the trachea, windpipe, the respiratory tree branches initially to form two main bronchi, airwaves, that enter the right and left lungs. The main bronchi then branch again and again, first forming smaller bronchi and then even smaller bronchioles. At the end of the smallest bronchioles, there are tiny grape-like air sacs called alveoli. It is in the alveoli that oxygen comes into contact with the red blood cells that will carry it to all parts of the body. In the rare cases, when influenza goes on to cause pneumonia, the alveoli tend to fill up with water and cellular debris. This prevents the red blood cells from picking up oxygen and causes hypoxia. Hypoxia simply means low oxygen. This is the main problem for patients with pneumonia.